You've probably heard of ant farms. But have you heard of ant farmers? How have ants evolved to actually grow and harvest their own food? We'll find out today when we speak with entomologist Dr. Ted Schultz. I should grab some lunch while I'm out here. Welcome everyone. We are live from Curious to bring you another episode of Smithsonian Science How. With us today is Smithsonian entomologist Dr. Ted Schultz to talk to us about farming and ants. Thank you so much to, for joining us, Ted. No, it's really great to be here. So Ted, we're really excited to learn about farming and ants. It's something that, I mean, I don't know how many people know that ants actually farm. But before we explore that big idea, we really want to know why ants are important in the first place. I'm sure many of our viewers think that they're just household pets. So let's ask our viewers what they think. Tell us why you think ants are important. Are they important because they have high biodiversity, live a long time, are really abundant, provide ecosystem services, or are super independent? Tell us what you think by picking the correct answer in the poll that appears to the right of your video screen. So Ted, we're both watching the polls come in and we see that 87% of our viewers think that they provide ecosystem services. How'd they do? Well, um, that's a really good answer and it's true. Um, there are a lot of species of ants. Um, there's something like 14,000 described. Another, we, we think there's 20,000 altogether. They are key members of most ecosystems. And if you went into a particular ecosystem and you had the magical power to remove all the ants, um, the ecosystem would fall apart. They, they have intimate relationships with lots of different plants and animals and insects. And they're a diverse group too. I'm seeing a lot of different types of ants on the screen here. Oh yeah, they're, they're, they're amazingly diverse. I mean, uh, 20,000 species that do all kinds of different things. So what makes them so successful? Well, that's a good question. And um, I think the key answer is they're social organisms. Um, there, are, there are other social organisms. Some bees are social, some wasps are social, all termites are social. There's even social naked mole rats, <laughs> but ants are arguably the most successful social organisms because um, they have the most species. Is there a special word for the super social behavior? Eusociality, which means true sociality. So what's unique about the social behavior of ants, um, especially when you compare them to other non-social animals? Well, um, all social organisms have a division of reproductive labor where you have workers that don't reproduce, and you have a queen that, or in the case of termites, a queen and a king that do reproduce. But what makes ants special is that in many lineages of ants, they've taken sociality to the next level. What does that mean? Well, um, uh, they, all, they all go through um, complete metamorphosis, but when- As the, we're seeing right here? As we see in this uh, image, but- um, The queen lays eggs. Some of them can d develop into workers, and they can develop into workers that all look the same in the primitive ants, or they can develop into workers um, that are normal-sized and soldier workers. And in other cases, um, they can develop into a lot of different sized workers. Do you have an example that you can show us here? Yeah. Um, I've got a, a, a tray of um, leafcutter ant, all from the same colony. Those are all from the same colony, so and those are all related. And this is the range of the sizes of workers from very tiny to big soldiers. And in the middle is the queen and a male. Wow, she's huge. Yeah, the queens are, are extremely large. So the queen, I mean, is that a queen in this picture Yeah, too? what you're seeing in this picture is a fungus garden that has lots of worker ants on it, and over on the right, a the queen, who is much larger than even the largest soldier ant in the colony. So soldier ants, what's their role in the colony? Well, um, 
as you might expect from the name, in a lot of ant species, the soldiers are the defenders. So if I'm down in the tropics and I'm digging up a leafcutter nest, for instance, all the soldiers, which have big heads and big mandibles, will converge on that spot like white blood cells in, a, um, in an organism and attack me. <laughs> like this? I wouldn't want to meet him if he was my size. Yeah, that's a, that's a very aggressive um, ant. <laughs> Um, other soldiers, I mean, are, um, are wimps and do other jobs. Um, they, they, in some ants, the soldiers crush seeds and run away when intruders come. So we're seeing, I think, ant intruding, what is this, other well, ant colonies? Well, so in the cases where soldiers are defending, they defend against me, they defend against ant eaters, but they also defend, as you can see here, they can defend against army ants because um, the way army ants make their living in many cases is they go into nests, they take the babies, the larvae and the pupae, and they take them away and they eat them. Some ants have taken this behavior, this brood robbing behavior, to the next level, and they take away pupae, as you see in this picture, that pupae. That white. That cocoon. Mm -hmm. um, they take them back to the nest, their nest, but they don't eat them. Instead, um, they raise them up and they use them as slaves. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow, that's a really sophisticated behavior. It's very sophisticated. That's not something I expected from something that I used to think were really just household pests. So where does farming come in? This is your specialty. Do all ants farm and no. grow their own food? Uh, no, um, only a small subset of ants farm, and those are the ants that I mostly study. Um, the, they're, ant, all ants are social, and because they're basically kind of like super organisms and they divide up the work, they can do some very complicated things like raid other nests or um, um, take slaves. But um, I think the most complicated thing that ants do, or certainly one of the most complicated, is they grow gardens for food. They are true farmers. So you mentioned leafcutter ants. Are leafcutter ants part of that fungus farming group? Yeah, leafcutter ants are some of the most highly evolved of fungus farming ants. You can see. Um, on the screen right now, leafcutter ants cutting up leaves. But um, also in the fungus farming ants, there are primitive fungus farmers that, are, um, that don't cut leaves. You showed me specifically how a leafcutter colony operates uh, earlier this week in your ant lab. Let's actually have a look at that and show our viewers. Okay. So this is really, really cool. What is it? Well, what you're looking at here is one of my pet leafcutter colonies. <laughs> Each of these plastic boxes is a chamber. Most of the chambers are filled with fungus gardens, but these two chambers up here are foraging chambers. They we've, are really busy. We've just fed them some leaves, so they're actively cutting up the leaves and carrying them through these tubes to the different fungus gardens. And when they get those cut up leaves to the fungus garden, they take them in, they cut them up into tiny, tiny pieces so that ultimately what's left is kind of a leaf mulch. Then they add that leaf mulch to the edge of the growing fungus garden. What do they do with the fungus? Well, they eat it. Ants absolutely need the fungus for survival. If they didn't have the fungus, they would die. It's their sole source of food for the adults and the larvae. All fungus growing ants depend on their garden fungi for food. So this is an incredible relationship here between the leaf cutters and the fungus. Thanks so much for sharing this, Ted. Sure. Ted, that was really neat to be in your ant lab and see that happening. And we're actually seeing it here now on the set of Science How. But these guys are really processing all of those leaves so quickly, I can see them hard at work. How much vegetation can they actually go through? Well, um, although this may be hard to believe, um, in South America, leafcutter colonies are basically the ecological equivalent of a large herbivorous mammal. Like a cow? Like a cow. So if you were to... For instance, take out, if you could take out all the ants in that colony and weigh them, um, they would weigh as much as maybe, an, maybe a cow. And if you could measure how much vegetation, fresh vegetation, they're harvesting every day, it would be as much as a cow eats. And they also live a very long time. They can live over, they can become over 15 years old. All right, let's get to some of our student questions. We have a lot of them coming in. This question comes in, well, they're going so fast, they're going off my screen. Wow. So this one comes from Canyon Ridge. What is a leafcutter ant? Can you describe one of them? 
Yeah, it's a, it's, an, it's a fungus farming ant, and not all fungus farming ants are leaf cutters. And it, but, it, but in particular, it harvests fresh vegetation, in some cases leaves, in other cases grasses, depending on the species, and, and feeds those to its fungus. It grows the fungus on that, that fresh plant material. So this question comes in by video, so let's have a look. Hi, I'm Daniel, and I was wondering how ants are more social than humans? Well, that's a really good question. Um, humans are social. Um, we, can, we live together in cooperative social groups just like ants, and we can live together in extended family groups. And, and um, our offspring, you know, our sons and daughters can stick around even to the age of 30 or more and just help us out with raising maybe their younger brothers and sisters. That's very much like ants. The thing about ants is um, the workers do not have the option of leaving and starting their own families. They are incapable of reproducing themselves. So the queen reproduces, the workers help, and um, that's, that's different from humans. Great question, Daniel. This question comes from Gavin from Southeastern Academy. What happens to the worker soldier ants when the queen dies? Well, um, what happens in most cases, when the queen dies, the colony dies. Um, the queen is essential for the survival of the colony. Great question. This one is coming in from Kyle and Parker. What climate do ants mostly live in? Well, the, the largest number of species is by far in equatorial regions. So um, there's lots and lots and lots of species in uh, Africa, Asia, South America, Australia, in the humid tropics. But um, ants do spread um, north and south into the temperate zones. So ants are important players in almost all um, ecosystems. Ted, we're looking right here at some of your study sites. I know you were recently in Brazil and Paraguay. Where else do you do your research and what do you do? Um, so I, because fungus farming ants are in, all in the New World and because they um, are largely in the South American tropics and Central American tropics, um, I spend a lot of time in South America and I've been in to many South American countries, particularly Brazil, and I was recently in Paraguay. And I'm look, surprisingly, um, even in the fungus farming ants, almost 50% of them are known only from one collection that of specimens that are in a museum somewhere. We know nothing of their biology. So I spend a lot of time trying to learn more about the biology of these species. So you're actually looking for living ants to be able to better understand the biology. I am, and, uh, and I spend a lot of time locating nests. And in these primitive small fungus growing ants, the nests are very small and very hard to find. And then I spend a lot of time digging up the nests and collecting the fungus gardens and the ants. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So I want to hear more about what you want to learn from these, but I think it's another great opportunity to ask our viewers what they think you can learn from studying living ants. Okay. Viewers, here's another opportunity to tell us what you think. What do living ants show you? Social behavior, personalities of ants, pest control options, or evolutionary patterns? You can respond using the window that appears to the right of your video screen. Ted, it's really fun watching these results come in. It looks like we have a smattering of answers, but most people think social behavior and evolutionary patterns. What do you find? Well, both, both of those are absolutely true, um, good answers, really good answers. Um, I, when I go out into to nature and I study these ants, I ask questions like, um, how big are the colonies? Are the, are the workers all the same size, or do they have regular workers and soldiers, or maybe even other sized ants. Um, how many, what's the nest architecture? How many chambers do they have? Um, uh, what are they bringing in that they're planting their fungus on? Um, and all of those, the, um, by studying these modern ants, I can understand evolutionary patterns that have occurred over time. So over time, how long are we talking here? How long have ants been farming? Um, based on all the evidence, we know they've been farming for about 55 million years. 55 million years? Yeah. That's a really long time. Yeah, and it compared to humans <laughs> who have been farming for maybe um, 10,000 to 12,000 years. Here's an example um, on the screen right now of a, 
fungus garden of a primitive fungus growing ant, they, this particular species likes to hang the fungus garden from the ceiling. Oh, wow. So that looks a lot different from the garden that we saw in your lab. Yeah, it is different. Yep. So what kind of evidence do you have that actually tells you that they have been farming for 55 million years? Is there anything in the fossil record? Yeah, I mean, um, there, in, surprisingly, there are a lot of ways that allow us to reconstruct the past. Um, the best thing would be a time machine. Unfortunately, <laughs> I haven't invented time machines yet. I'm, I'm first in line for, for when they do. I'll be second. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but um, there are fossils. So there are a lot of fossils of ants, but for fungus farming ants, um, there's only f fossils in Dominican amber. Is that what we're seeing here? Yeah, so these are. this is an example of two pieces of Dominican amber, and as you can see, those pieces are very small. So teeny, I mean, that's a quarter. And for... even smaller are the ants inside of them. But I can look, <laughs> that's what one of those ants looks like. I can look back in time by um, looking into that piece of amber under a microscope. So how old is that amber? Well, the amber is unfortunately only about 15 million years old. That sounds like a lot, but the ant, Fungus growing ants are 55 million years old, so we have to rely on other sources of evidence to understand what happened all that time ago. What evidence is that? Well, we, can, we spend a lot of time constructing phylogenies. These are evolutionary trees or family trees of insects and ants. This on the screen is a family tree, a phylogeny of all insects. And if you look down at the bottom, uh, the bottommost part, you see that beetles and moths and butterflies are each other's closest relatives. They're more closely related to each other than they are to ants, bees, and wasps. And, then if, and so as you move to the left on this tree, you're moving back in time and you're looking at their shared common ancestors. And that shared common ancestor of all three of those groups must have evolved complete metamorphosis. This is metamorphosis where you go through um, a larva, a pupa, and an adult, which other insects don't have. So you're really taking the DNA from living species that are on Earth today, yes. and you're putting them on a family tree to better understand their evolution yep, through time. Yep, we're using um, DNA sequences and computer algorithms to construct family trees of species. So what does the family tree for fungus farming ants look like? It looks like this. So in this, uh, this is a, a, a phylogeny for fungus farming ants. Um, moving to the left, you're going back in time. At the most extreme right, the tips of the branches are living species of fungus growing ants, or more accurately, their DNA sequences of living species. And as we move to the left, um, species that are closely related coalesce into their common ancestors. And then though, as we move farther to the left, those common ancestors coalesce into other common ancestors and we can work our way all the way back to 50 to 55 million years ago to the common ancestor of all fungus farming ants, the ant that first began to practice agriculture. Wow, so these DNA sequences can help you understand the evolutionary pattern all the way back through 55 million years. Yes. And I saw the ant heads on that phylogeny, yes. on that family tree too. Are we looking at just fungus farmers here? These are just fungus farming ants and you can see there's a wide diversity of them. Um, the last few are in leaf cutter ants, the most recently evolved ones. So when you're looking at that tree, does it help you understand anything about the crop they're growing? I mean, we grow corn and tomatoes. These ants are growing fun fungus, but is it all the same? It's not all the same, and that's um, the thing I'm most interested in is um, the associations and the symbiotic evolution between the ants and the fungi that they grow. And when I look at that tree, and, I, and because I know what fungi they're growing, I can see that the pattern is very non-random. Closely related groups of ants are cultivating closely related groups of fungi. What you're seeing on the screen right now is the fungus garden of a lower primitive fungus growing ant that is growing, that they are uh, constructed on the bottom of a rotten log in uh, Amazonian Brazil. Wow, that's really Here's cool. Here's another example of um, a, a garden chamber that we removed the fungus from and another garden chamber that still has the fungus garden in it. So, Ted, not only do these ants grow their own fungus, but you showed me in your ant lab when I visited that they actually tend to it and keep it healthy. Want to show the visitors? Yeah, I sure do. All right, let's take another look. How do they keep the garden healthy? Well, it's a big job. 
because there are a lot of microbes, bacteria, and other fungi that are constantly trying to eat the garden fungus. So every square centimeter of this garden is visited by an ant every few seconds. Wow, they're very diligent. They're extremely <laughs> diligent. What they do is, if they encounter some bad mold or bacteria, they try to pluck it out. If they can't do that, they apply antibiotics to it to control it. And those antibiotics originate either in glands on the ants' bodies or from bacteria that are growing on the bodies of the ants. In all the highly evolved fungus growing ants like these leaf cutters, the fungus is also dependent on the ants. We know that the fungus is not found outside of associating with ants. So Ted, as you've just described to us, the fungus and the ants are living in this kind of symbiosis. But then we have another player, bacteria, which is also another living organism. I mean, how does that live um, in the presence of the fungus and the ants? Well, what it, it, the ants have glands that nourish the bacteria to promote their growth on their bodies so that they can use these antibiotics and maybe other things that we don't know about. Oh, for instance, in this picture, um, underneath the chin of that ant that's looking straight at you, you can see a patch of this white actinomycete bacterium. Actinomycetes are a kind of bacterium that um, humans also get antibiotics from. Here's a, an electron micrograph of, of that ant, um, and on the left you can see what that bacterium looks like. It's filamentous. So there's really a very complex and sophisticated practice going on here with the fungus, the ants, and the bacteria all living together to promote healthy ants and a fungus crop. Yeah, the, the closer we look at the system, the more and more complicated it gets and the more microorganisms we discover that are part of this symbiosis. So in that video segment, you started to mention that some of the fungus actually cannot survive without the ants. Well, that's, that's true, and that's also very interesting. Um, all fungus farming ants need their fungi to survive. They can't live without it. But in the primitive fungus growing ants, the fungi that they grow are able to live without the ants. But in the more highly evolved fungus growing ants, including the leaf cutters, something has changed, and their fungi cannot live without them. So in that case, you have a true mutualistic symbiosis in which both the ants and the fungi depend on each other. This is a really interesting relationship and something I never expected from ants. It sounds like we really have a thing or two to learn about their pra farming practices, even though I would think that they might want to deviate from their fungus diet for like a <laughs> Snickers bar or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We offer them things and they never take them. So. <laughs> They stick with their fungi. But yeah, I would, um, if you think about it, these ants have been practicing agriculture for 55 million years, um, and they could just sort of decimate all of the trees in their neighborhoods, but they don't. Somehow they're practicing sustainable agriculture. They've also been using antibiotics for 55 million years. And the, the microorganisms that are the target of these antibiotics seem like could have res evolved resistance, and maybe they even have, but somehow the ants are able to come up with antibiotics that continue to work in this system. Humans have been practicing agriculture for a much shorter time, and we have trouble with our pesticides. Um, we ha the um, pests evolve resistance, and sa the same with medicine. We've been using antibiotics for only 75 years, and our um, diseases evolve resistance. So I'd like to believe that humans could learn something about agriculture and maybe even medicine from ants. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. It sounds like we do have a little to learn from them. So we have a ton of questions coming in from our viewers. Let's get to some of them. Okay. This question comes from the students watching here in Curious, the Tacoma Education Campus. How did ants evolve? Where did they come from? Well, ants are basically um, ground-dwelling wingless, in the case of the workers, um, wasps. They're, um, they come from a group of wasps that are called hunting wasps that, as far as we know, it's, it's still kind of a, a, a question we're asking, but they're clearly wa stinging wasps that evolved eusociality in which the workers have no wings. Ellie and Dylan from Canyon Ridge would like to know where queens come from. Well, um, if you think about solitary wasps, wasps that are not social, each individual is like a queen. I mean, they're queens. They have wings, they lay eggs, 
So the real question to ask is where do workers come from? Um, in ants, they invented this new thing called workers. And Peyton and Riley ask a related question. Are there king ants? Well, the um, king ants would be the males that I just described that go out and mate. They don't, unfor unfortunately for them, they don't um, spend the rest of their lives with the queen. They, they just die. <laughs> Great questions coming in. Ted, we have another question coming in by video, so let's have a look. Hi, I'm Gigi, and I was wondering if farming ants eat anything other than the fungi they grow. Yeah, um, actually, I kind of oversimplified in that video. They have to eat their fungus to survive, and that's true for the larvae and the adults. But adults, if they're wandering around and they uh, discover a, a piece of fruit or something, they will drink the fruit juice from it, and they'll share it with their nest mates. Like all ants, um, they have a, a, a social stomach, and they can store things in that stomach and regurgitate it to their fellow workers. Frank wants to know, and kind of related, how they actually make their gardens. Well, it starts out with the queen. She has to carry a bit of her mother's garden with her in her mouth when she starts her new nest. She spits it out, and she takes care of that garden until her, worker, her first babies turn into workers and start taking care of it. And then it gets slowly built, and then more rapidly built from there. So um, basically, they're bringing in new leaves and things and adding it to the garden and expanding the garden. Ted, how did you get your start as an entomologist? What made you interested to pursue this career? Well, when I was a kid, um, I spent a lot of time outdoors and I loved animals. I loved to collect lizards and snakes and frogs and toads. And I also liked to collect insects. And I really liked to try to keep them alive. And um, I, learned, I learned more about biology, but um, then years went by when I was doing other things, and then when I was much older, I, I decided, I'm going to study biology, and, I, and there's been no looking back since then. Ted, if some of our viewers watching today are interested in ants and entomology, where can they learn more? Well, um, you know, we have barely scratched the surface of discovery of the natural world. Contrary to what a lot of people think, there's... It, we've mostly, it's mostly unknown. We only know a, a very small amount. So anybody going in, this generation, the, your generation, um, going into biology could make, will make a huge difference in our knowledge base. So, you know, go to a museum, um, uh, go to a public library and check out books, take a biology class, and by all means, go outdoors and look around. Even if you live in the middle of a city, there are thousands of insect species that you could be watching. Ted, thank you so much for sharing all this wonderful information. You're welcome. It was great. And viewers, thank you so much for all of your awesome questions and for being here today on Smithsonian Science How. If you want to learn more about ants, you can visit the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History's website, uh, The Hidden Life of Ants, and you can also visit antweb.org. If you missed part of this program or want to see it again, it'll be archived later this evening at curious.si.edu. And we hope to see you next time on Smithsonian Science How. Thanks so much for being here.